Hey everybody, it is Irene here, and I've been having some minor technical, di technical difficulties, and um, just here to do a little mini workshop today in the Healthy Nervous System Revolution Facebook group. And before I get started, I wanna make sure that I am coming through right now. So when I hear back from Aaron, I will begin. And we'll wait for maybe a few people to hop on too. So give us a little moment. And if you need to grab anything, I would suggest grabbing a piece of paper and a pen because I'm gonna be covering some important topics, things that you might wanna take some notes on. So maybe grab some paper and a pen. I've got mine in case I um, need to remind myself of something that I don't forget. But I'm just waiting to make sure that we are broadcasting here. Oh, that's funky. I didn't realize I could go in black and white. All right, let's keep it normal. Super. So, I... I'm being told that I can be seen. Looks like there's a little bit of a delay. And and the other question, can you guys hear me? Maybe give me a little thumbs up or a little note, a little comment if you're hearing me come through. With all our amazing technology, things are never always 100% perfect, and that's okay. Awesome, I see a thumbs up, whoever that was. Thank you. All right. Perfect. Cool. So for everybody here today, welcome. My name is Irene Lyon and I do a lot of things. And one of the things I do is I teach people about their nervous system and nervous system health and healing from trauma. And there's this is such a big topic and I hope that being in this group has given you a little more insight into what your nervous system actually is what trauma actually really is. And it might be very new to you, which means that you are just starting to learn that there is this thing called a nervous system and that it's important to take care of and what trauma is. And I wanna, there's so many themes around this topic, which is why I do suggest checking out the materials that I have, the free resources that I have that are linked up through my website, irenelion.com because this is not something that can be learned and consumed in a matter of a week or even a month or even a year. And I say that because I've watched my students go through the work I do, whether it's working one-on-one -on -one or in my programs, and it takes a few passes. I've been doing this work since, technically since 2000 and, I always forget the year, four, 2004. And I really got heavily into working at the nervous system level and how trauma gets trapped in the nervous system and causes nervous system dysregulation. So I'm gonna say that again, nervous system dysregulation. And I came across this idea in 2008 when I realized as a Feldenkrais practitioner, as a mind-body practitioner, I was already working in the field of mind-body. I'd been working in fitness and in nutrition since 1994. Five, it was 1995, and even in 2008-ish, I was still learning all these things that I had not learned about around stress and what stress really is and how it gets trapped in our survival instincts, in those fight, flight, and freeze instincts that we need when we go under attack, when we go under threat, when we are rendered in many ways helpless. And it's a big body of work. So as we move into the new year with this group, I'm actually gonna be a little more um, specific in particular with who, not who, but with what is posted because, and if you watched my little video that I did yesterday, I'll give you a little recap. When someone is in this group and they post a question about something, um, an ailment or a health problem, there's like a barrage of um, 
there are a barrage of comments with really good advice, whether it's essential oils to nutrition to various forms of therapy. And I got nothing against this stuff. I really don't. Um, there are essential oils and good food in my cupboards as well. But if we don't have the foundations on board, and I'm going to cover what these foundations are, if we don't have the foundations on board and if we don't understand what's going on, maybe like if you have hands right now that are free, just touch your brain, touch your, your heart, your lungs, your guts. Know that underneath these hands in this body of yours is a magnificent, magnificent orchestration of neurochemistry and neurophysiology and signaling mechanisms that are working based on not only your genetics, but your history, your nurturing, how you were brought up, how you were raised, and also how your parents were raised and your grandparents. So why am I saying this? I'm saying this because I want everyone here who's in this community to really understand the importance, the importance of getting these foundations on board. So I'm gonna go through them. And I, I already mentioned this, I think, at the beginning, but if you're jumping on right now, grab a uh, paper, if you have some paper, or if you like to type your keyboard, um, pen, your fingers, and I'm gonna go through this. And I keep looking over here, not because I'm ignoring you, but because I'm wanting to make sure there's no other messages coming in. And if you've got some questions, please type them under this stream. And I'm gonna do my best to see those questions as they come in. I often try to finish my thoughts so that I'm not put off with, with where I'm going in my brain and my thinking, which is you know what we have to do. And um, we'll just kind of go from there and we'll hang out for about an hour or less, depending on the questions and where we go with the answers. So like I said a moment ago, I'm all about foundations, foundations, foundations. And here's a common scenario that happens is someone will be unwell and they'll go see a healer who does something. We'll just make it really neutral. And let's say that that person gets a little bit of relief, a little bit of um, benefit, right? This happens a lot. And they're like, great, this is exactly what I need. And then two seconds, not two seconds, but let's say a month or a year down the, uh, down the road, they get this other problem or this other symptom or something comes back. And then there's this assumption that that form of work that they went to have done, whether it's healing or, or therapy, what have you, wasn't good, that it didn't work. And the thing is, well, did it work or didn't it work? It did work in the moment, right? It did work in the moment. But what's happening is that typically, this is a hypothetical, but typically what I see happening is that person never actually learned the reason why the symptom or the syndrome came up. In medicine, we would say we're basically, um, Band-aiding, right? Who here's heard of that? I'm sure everybody's heard of this. Just you're just putting a band-aid um, on, and it can help with symptom relief and management, but it's not getting to the root of the problem. And then a person thinks that their system is either broken or that the person they saw didn't know what they were doing. And Isaac, great question. You're leading me into the next piece. You ask, does your teaching use neuroplasticity to calm the nervous system? This is a great question. So yes, I um, work at the level of neuroplastic healing. So there are these pillars of neuroplastic healing, which I'm gonna go into, and there's a proper sequencing that has to happen with neuroplastic healing. To give a quick definition, um, and just so you know, you guys, I'm doing this with my hands because it's cold right now in my home. So as I move them through the air, they're getting chillier. Um, neuroplasticity, by definition, is the ability for our entire system, 
People often say it's the ability for the brain to rewire, but it's not just the brain. I'm gonna make a note so I don't forget to talk to you guys about this. Um, it's not just the brain, it's the entire nervous system. And there are many nervous systems in your body. It's the ability for muscle tissue to regenerate, bones to heal, linings of the gut to regenerate. And it also means that when we've gone through stress, traumatic event where our system, so I'm gonna show you my hand here, is going through a nice ebb and flow, okay? Hopefully you can see that. And then a trauma comes in and disrupts that ebb and flow and the system kind of goes into like a bit of a chaos. Maybe it shuts down or maybe it goes into like a hyper or it shuts down or it goes into a hyper vigilance mode where everything, there, there's a fear of everything. So it throws this nice ebb and flow off. Um, when that occurs, the nervous system goes into chaos. It goes into dysregulation. That's the term, dysregulation. So part of neuroplastic healing, part of neuroplasticity is reteaching the entire system, the neurochemistry, the neurophysiology, all of it, the endocrine system, how to come back to baseline and back to that ebb and flow. So yes, it teaches in neuroplasticity, but, or and, it isn't just about calming the nervous system. And this is something that is kind of misrepresented in the brain science in the rewiring world as people are saying, oh, it's just about calming the system. Here's the thing. Sometimes we need to calm the system. We need to take it out of a hyper arousal and bring it back down to baseline. Sometimes the system is in that loop of high arousal, we call it anxiety, I don't like that term because it's really a high arousal, a hyper arousal of the nervous system and the sensations in the body. Sometimes we need to actually keep a system going up the ladder of what we would call fight flee energy so that it can finally hit a threshold high up, kind of like a thermostat, Isaac, so that it then can come back down and reset. And a lot of what's happening right now in the mind-body community, in the health and healing community, is that, and I was guilty of this before I understood this, I was quite quite in the hip, hypocrisy, hypocrite stage because I didn't understand this in my 20s. And I would teach people to breathe and take a breath and relax. But I didn't understand the science. I didn't understand nervous system physiology, which is when we've had a trauma come in and it has disrupted that flow and we're in this shaky waters, sometimes we need to let those shaky waters float to the beach and then absorb into the sand, if I use that analogy. We can't just stop those shaky waters by trying to calm the system. If you think about that water analogy I just gave you with the beach, if you were to try to contain a tsunami or a big, big wave, right, with um, let's say a concrete wall and try to calm it back down, it's not gonna calm back down. It's gonna keep that kinetic energy, that force inside of it, inside of the water, and it's gonna go somewhere else. Right? If you really imagine that, if there's these big waves wanting to crash and reset at the beach on the shore, and we try to stop it, it's gonna go somewhere else. So we want to teach the body, we want to teach the body, the brain, really the nervous system, it's the nervous system more so, not the brain, and I'll make a distinction with that in a second. We want to teach it how to be with these big waves, these big waves that aren't just nice and flowy so that, so that we can surf them, literally surf them, like if you're on the ocean in a big wave to the shore. And what happens is that so many people are taught these management strategies to keep the waves from coming into shore. And then those waves, they literally, from a neurophysiological point of view, they go somewhere else into the body, and then that's what creates chronic illness. 
right? I'm gonna really pause on that, that part. When we don't allow the system to find its natural set point and discharge, we would call it also deactivation, coming out of that, that high stress response, if we don't allow it to come back to shore naturally, it's gonna create chaos and havoc somewhere else in the system. This is where genetics comes in. Some people, all of us, have a predisposition for something. It's just the way human DNA works. Some people have hardier systems. No matter what stress gets thrown at them, they just seem to be able to persevere and keep going. Other people aren't as um, robust. They're more fragile. This then could take us into the branch of talking about early childhood adversity and how early childhood adversity, abuse, trauma, medical procedures, birth trauma, in utero trauma, transgenerational trauma, fevers when you're a baby, being hospitalized, having an infection, having a near-death experience like choking, fainting and hitting your head, there are so many things that create our nervous system to go a little shaky when we're really little, when really during that time we need to be building strong foundations. Let's come back to foundations now, the full circle. So what we see is some people just have more robustness, that's a word, as adults. Typically when we go back in time and look at the history, those who are more robust in a healthy way, who aren't coping and managing and pretending to be okay, because I see a lot of this too, those who are really more resilient, they usually had a much stronger first three years of their life and, and they also had parents that had strong, healthy, secure nervous systems. The trouble right now in our culture, especially in North America, in Australia and in the UK kind of Europe Europe areas and Asia is that there's been so much transgenerational trauma and abuse to our parents grandparents great grandparents whether it was being abused as children the way we were schooled poverty etc war that we're having to stop right now in our current generation which is so cool the young people are finally really understanding the importance of this, not all young people, but a lot of them, that we need to break these cycles and rewire our nervous systems now, um, especially if we have little kids, if we have grand grandchildren, if we're about to have children, so that we don't pass this on. So if I go back a little bit, these foundations are very important and everyone is different and so when there is a ailment in a person's system and it's really clear that the general recommendations nutrition exercise setting up you know a, a safe space in your home homeopathy naturopathic medicine psychotherapy mind body meditation if all these things are still not getting to the root, then chances are there's an underlying tsunami or the ocean's just frozen. There's two sides to the nervous system or a spectrum really where a person can be really shut down or really on hyper arousal. And then there's this spectrum because some people will be shut down in certain situations, but hyper aroused in others. So this is why there isn't this one size fits all kind of thing. And Kimberly asked here, hopefully you're still here, Kimberly. Is this the same as attempting to stop a panic attack? Yes, it is. And panic attack is basically the system being overcome by a biological fear response. It isn't, well, it can. We can make ourselves create a panic attack or an anxiety attack or a stomach pain Right, that's what psychosomatic illness is, when the psyche creates a shift in the body, the neurochemistry, and then we get a symptom or a syndrome. But more often than not, if you ask people that have severe panic attacks and anxiety, there is 
something internal, like in this body system, that den denounces, that says fear, fear, fear. There's a fear, and it's not cognitive. It's completely biological. But then what happens is we try to calm it down by thinking things, by resourcing, by breathing it down, by breathing it out. Interesting little tidbit, when we increase our breath, we actually increase our heart rate. It's when we exhale, long and slow, that brings our heart rate down. This is one reason why singing for many people can be very calming or playing a musical instrument where you blow out because it's, it's forcing the physiology to do a lot of exhale and that actually down re regulates the heart rate. However, Kim, Kimberly, this is not a fix, right? This is not a remedy to heal and rewire the nervous system. And what's happening is that a lot of people think that these breathing exercises and these meditations, as an example, are going to rewire the system because a person feels calm momentarily. It isn't. And um, I'm in no way opposed to spiritual practice, using your breath as a way to just tune into your body as an exercise, mindfulness, vipassana, nothing against it. I'm actually gonna be posting a new interview very soon, hopefully this weekend. It's a long one with my good friend, Chris Dierkes. He's a ex-priest actually and monk and spiritual teacher. Um, I consult with him when I have some sticky topics I need to deal with in my own world. Um, and we talk about what meditation is, what it is for, what it's not for. It wasn't developed for stress relief. It's not supposed to be for calming us down. Actually, when we go into deeper meditation practices, believe it or not, we will probably and we will want to feel more agitation because we're going deep and in, in, into the, as he calls it, into the depths of the ocean where all of the weird sea creatures live. All the weird things that we've not wanted to fo focus on and feel are found when we do real deep meditative spiritual practice which is a great segue to go into why we need to build foundations first, why we need to build capacity in the body first. Because if we go deep into ourselves, into these places, one of two things happens. We feel something so big and so foreign and novel and really quite scary that the system goes, holy shit, this is huge, that's that tsunami wave, and I'm gonna freak out and I'm gonna try to run away from it and I'm gonna run and I'm gonna panic and I'm gonna go into a more of a hyper, we would maybe even call it manic. And I know from talking with my students that in a lot of practices, people will have what we call a kundalini, um, I forget what it's called, it's not kundalini syndrome, but it's a situation where a person has a kundalini awakening, let's just call it that, but they fragment their system. In, in, our, in my work, I'm trained in something called um, somatic experiencing, which is the work of Peter Levine, and somatic practice, which is the work of Kathy Kane, with a K. When a person sees that big wave coming or they feel it and they're like, oh my God, I gotta get out of here, I can't, I can't be with this, I'm gonna go crazy, and they do go crazy, we call that blowing up the nervous system because the system didn't have a strong tether. It's very different than being grounded. It didn't have the capacity to deal with that big tsunami wave that it found. So this is a big thing. So that's one thing. And then the other thing is someone will see that big wave coming or they'll feel what's going on in their internal system and they are so clever and so smart these people because they know that it's in there. And so what occurs is that they then shut down. They put up like this frozen wall around them so that they don't feel it when that wave hits. From a neurophysiological point of view and a hormonal point of view and, on, and a metabolic point of view, when we shut and freeze down ourselves to these big waves, not only do we shut ourselves down to that big wave of emotion or sensation, we shut down all our other physiological processes which a human needs for healthy function. This is why 
so many folks get things like chronic illness, fibromyalgia, autoimmune illnesses, fatigue. They may seem calm and very loving and gentle, and but it's actually a shutdown response. There is no affect. There's no ebb and flow. It's just frozen. Something can happen to them and it doesn't even phase them. And people then compliment them on being very calm and very conserved and very reserved and very um, able to handle big stresses. But if we were to look at their underlying stress chemistry in that frozen block of sensation and emotion is a whirlwind going on. And a person can stay in that whirlwind for quite a long time if they're eating really well, if they have some good relationships, if they like the work they do. I'm seeing this a lot in the entrepreneurial world where there's some high hitters going really hard and really fast and they, they have the money so they can eat well and they have good therapy and good body work. They exercise, but there's like this ticking time bomb going on in their systems and they'll only be able to handle that for so long and then the system is gonna give, it's gonna break. Um, so I kind of went off on a little bit of a rant there. <laughs> Maybe it wasn't a rant, but Kim, you said, the, psycho the psychotherapists that I work with are more focused on discovering the roots of my traumas and not so much symptom management. That's wonderful. So in discovering the roots, um, the other thing, sometimes if the roots are pre-verbal, if they were before the age of three, which so many of us, they are, it's going to be tough to cognitively and memory-wise pull those back up because there is no cognitive memory. There is no what we call declarative memory where you remember, excuse me, when you were, when that bad thing happened, you were drinking out of a red mug or the sun was shining in or you were at grandma's, or you were at the play fair, at the, the, you know, you were somewhere. If you don't have that kind of declarative memory around a traumatic event, it's harder to piece it together, which is where working at the level of the somatic body, which is what I do, is very, very important because the memory, the trauma is in the physiology. It's in the muscle tissue, it's in the movements that haven't been completed, the threat responses that haven't been completed. And this is where, if I come back to foundations, that's what this topic was today. The first thing that I do with anyone when they come to work with me, whether it's private or in group, is education, 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 education. Education, 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 lots of education. And I, I kind of am like making that a bit of a joke, but, um, and I've told this story to a few people before. And for those of you on here, and if you have questions, just pop them in. Happy to keep answering them as they come up. Um, I met some folks a little while ago. I tell this story every now and again, uh, and they did some form of healing work, some form of stress management work, and they, they um, found ways to work with the parasympathetic nervous system. The parasympathetic nervous system is a complex nervous system. It isn't just the rest, digest, calm down system. It does calm us down. It brings us down. But it, depending on the type of situation a person is in, the parasympathetic either shuts us down really fast, protects us, puts us into shock, or it... Um, hopefully is how you guys are right now with me. It puts us into a calmer state where we're socially engaging, where we're able to connect with each other and that connection calms us down. We want to be in that side of the parasympathetic nervous system for the bulk of our life as mammals, as mammals, because we need lots of blood, lots of oxygen, lots of human connection to calm ourselves and to be healthy. But this gentleman, they, they said this is what they did. And I asked, oh, well, do you teach your students the difference between the different branches of the parasympathetic, specifically the vagus nerve, because the vagus nerve is the parasympathetic. And I didn't, didn't go into it, but I just was, I was kind of testing him. I was being a little bit of a stinker. And um, 
he said, oh, no, 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 we don't, we don't want to confuse our, our clients with the branches of the parasympathetic. I, I know what that is, but I don't need to teach them that. And I went, well, okay. And I didn't actually challenge him on it. And I left the table. I sat somewhere else and had a lovely time with another table. But bottom line, and there's actually an article on my site, Aaron, if you're still here, you could post this or I'll post it later. Um, the article... I'm losing the name of it. I think it's why we why we can blame our parents for all our shortcomings, um, which is kind of tongue in cheek. But we learn how to have our nervous system based on our parents' nervous system. We borrow it from them when we're young. This is why things seem genetic. This is why many people think depression and addiction and chronic illness and that runs in the family. Very small percentages of diseases are passed down in true genetic fashion. It's like, I won't get the stat right, but it's, it's less than 5%. It's very, very small. Most of these traits that we carry through are due to environmental situations with our parents. And I don't mean the environment like trees and, and, toxins, I mean how we see them act, how we mimic them, it oozes towards us as little people and then that's how we wire from the beginning our nervous system. I just have to have a drink of water, guys. Yes, Erin, that's the article. The origins of our coping mechanisms um, when we're stressed out and why we can blame our parents. And I, you know, when I work with my people, a lot of people will kind of poo-poo me for shaming parents. And you know what? Sometimes we have to be a bit of a, we need to judge a little bit. Sometimes things that parents do are wrong and we actually need to say, that's not right. You guys got to change that. Um, so I always like to say everyone's to blame and no one's to blame. We're just in this situation as a species, as humans, where we just haven't been talking about this stuff. So... Education, education, education. I told you that story where I met this person at a conference for a reason. My biggest care, if you don't ever work with me, get on my site, watch my vlogs, consume the education. I've had people that have come to just little mini workshops, even things like this, and just understanding that you have a stress response that is fight flight that if things are too overwhelming, you go into shutdown. That when the fight, flight, and shutdown are kind of competing and chaotic together because of your early shitty childhood or having a surgery when you were really young that put you into shutdown or a combo of both or your parents, um, grandparents survived the Holocaust or Hurricane Katrina or something, by knowing that, it gives you extra information. And I've seen people start to shift and change the ways that they act based on just having the education. So I cannot, I beg of all of you watching this, get the education before you choose to go do a million different therapies in 2017, because we're at that cusp right now where people are like, what am I going to do next year, right? What am I going to do to help my this problem, that problem, that problem, before even starting to look into the modality, learn the science, because it will last you a lifetime, a lifetime. So Kim says, or Kimberly, yes, double exclamation, I have pre-verbal traumas that are attempting to communicate with me. Yeah, exactly. We, uh, we completely dismiss and don't ask these questions. Um, I have another really good article called um, The Five Telltale Signs That Your Coaching Clients Have Undiagnosed Trauma. So for those of you that don't know, a lot of the work I do is working with healers, mind-body coaches, practitioners, helping them pinpoint better when their clients may need a little extra work. Because what I've seen in the coaching world way too much is people coming in because they're blocked, they have trouble um, knowing what they wanna do with their business, finding clients, they have trouble charging what they're worth, 
they have fear at putting up a site, writing an article, and a lot of the work that gets done is cognitive mindset, affirmations, goal setting, planning, organizing, da 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 And they try this, but then like a week later or a month later or a year later or five years later, they're still working on the same damn problem. And if we really look at a lot of this, a lot of these people have undiagnosed trauma and many, it's preverbal. So it was, it is, a, it's not a cognitive fear. It is a true biological fear that is running the front of their bus. And here's the thing, very important note to know. When our stress physiology is running the boat, even if we seem very calm, very zen, right? If under that is like wildy coyote going around crazy in your nervous system physiology, it is virtually impossible to use your higher brain. This cortex of ours, maybe put your hands on your brain, that allows us to write and type and communicate and even the part that can be empathetic and love and care for other human beings on this planet and the environment and animals, that's part of our higher brain centers called the cortex, prefrontal cortex. I'm simplifying, but you get the picture. It's this part, it's what makes us human. If our stress chemistry is running the show, this does not work. It can work a little bit, but it doesn't work 100%. doesn't work in full function. So what happens is that there's this undiagnosed trauma going on that's often preverbal, and it's hard in our affluent, more affluent communities because we had food and we had shelter and parents didn't beat each other. I just had a lapse in my connection there, you guys. Subtle lapse and misattunements that cause a little person to feel a little unsafe, a little unsure, a little, I'm not so sure if this is where I'm supposed to be right now, but I'm here with these people that I think are my caregivers and my safety mechanisms, but they're kind of preoccupied. And so this is how preverbal trauma can start. I hope you guys are still hearing me. You guys still hearing me? Give me a, a thumbs or a yes. I had a little dip in my internet connection there. Cool, thanks guys. This is very real time and live. All right, Isaac has another question. Can you lightly touch upon drug use like marijuana? Yes, I can. I have chronic fatigue sy syndrome and dealt with incredible fear response and illogical thoughts. Tiger always in the room, yeah. Just can't tell if 15 years of chronic use has led to where I am today, bed bound. So I'm gonna, talk, I'm gonna start with something that I've heard some of, my, some of my colleagues who practice the work of Peter Levine, SE, a lot, not a lot, but I've heard a few who will not work with people who are chronic um, marijuana users because that drug when used, usually when used excessively and not as real shamanic medicine, which I can tell you living in Vancouver, BC, we're famous for our BC bud, um, there's a lot of people that abuse it. And what happens with the substance is it more so than alcohol actually it completely shuts down and numbs the system um, smell can go lots of things can go our senses get dulled which is why it's such a powerful medicine for pain when people have significant pain um, so the thing that I like to say, Isaac, with folks who have dealing, been dealing with some form of addiction is before you try to get rid of that substance, you need to build the capacity, you need to build the foundations. And I'll get to this again in a second. But it's also very indicative that when we have these, these substances in our system that depress us, and put us into a state that is more numb, which is probably what we want, because things are too intense. Like you said, the, the tiger is in the room. 
we need to kind of find a way to cope. And if we don't have another safety net, another way out, it's the only way we know. So I just want to tell you that that is something that you had to do to survive. And now the question is, okay, what can happen to move forward and to shift this and to build up the capacity in your body system and of course get the support that you might need if you can so that you can start to find ways to have it less or if you already have stopped um, heal the the system so if we think of neuroplastic healing um, one of the most important parts at the beginning is what we call neuromodulation now neuromodulation means being able to bring the hyper aroused nervous system or the shutdown nervous system back to a state of a little more aliveness a little more energy a little more more life force and um oh before i forget aaron if you're still there can you post the new vlog that i just put up on my site it's also in this group i posted it last night it's on anger so one of the more important emotions that we do not know how to work with in our culture is anger and healthy aggression, right? Grr, that kind of life force energy, go forward and do, do, do. Um, interestingly enough, the term aggression comes from the Latin word agredi, which means to move forward, to push through. It's not a violent word. It's actually a word that's just like, come on, let's get up and have some energy in our system. And when there's been trauma, which I'm going to assume, Isaac, there has been some form of trauma in your, in your world, um, or surgery, or something, that chronic illness that's led you down this path, um, our healthy life force energy is kind of hidden, it's dead, and we need to slowly, slowly get it moving again. So when I work with folks, we use specific tools to what I call increase the capacity in the body. I call it um, expanding your swimming pools. So if you think about a swimming pool, good old fashioned swimming pool, like a, a lap pool, if it's really small, so if this mug was my swimming pool, if it was really small, only so much can fit in there, right? And then the body also has within it, within the capacity, stress and past trauma. And I liken that to beach balls. So if you have this big swimming pool with lots and lots of beach balls in it, like so many beach balls, there's no movement in that system. It's just stuck. And so we have to do one of two things when we start to build foundation after we've done the education is we have to start finding ways to increase the swimming pool so that the beach balls that are in there, the stressors, are less packed, they're less tight, so there's a little bit more movement. How do we increase that capacity? It is very, very dependent on the person, but one of the ways I start is obviously with education, then it's doing very basic exercises to bring more self-awareness to your body, more awareness to the environment. So for everyone on right now watching, if you want to take a little break and just feel your butt on your chair or your back against the chair or your feet on the ground, just actually take a second to just sense body contact. Because I've been talking, talking, so you're in your brain. But what we want in a perfect world, we talk about perfect world, we want to have this self-awareness to ourselves and the environment pretty much all the time when we're awake, when we're not sleeping. So just take a second and just feel your body against your chair, the pressure. And then just start to let your eyes, very small, just sort of see one thing that's in your space. My eyes immediately go to um, these red flowers that we have in the kitchen, the poinsettia. It's, a, it's Christmas time here in uh, BC. 
So sensing contact with your body as well as seeing one thing. And then see something else. My, my eyes now are going to my, my bag. It's hung up on a hook over there. So what I'm guiding you through right now, it's not rocket science. It's very simple. If you've never practiced just the act of feeling your body in contact with the floor or the chair or the bed or the couch, while also connecting with something in your environment, it might seem really simple or it might seem actually really tough. So if anybody just tried that and found it really hard to feel the bum against the chair while also staying with that feeling and connecting to something, maybe just say, if you did in the comments, I'd be curious to know. Or did it feel good to connect and slow down and feel contact with the environment while also connecting with the environment with your eyes? So please feel free to put some comments in there. Because this orienting to the world is what we lose when we have any type of traumatic event, when we have any kind of dysregulation, we become disoriented. We don't know where we are or we feel unsafe. Um, often when it's pre-verbal trauma, the environment is unsafe, the people around us are unsafe. And so one of the ways to start to build these foundations, it's not about deep breathing, it's not about changing the brain and the thoughts, it's about the basic sense of safety and feeling the present moment, letting your neurophysiology know I'm here right now. There's my cup of tea, got some water there, there's a bag, etc. And Mary says, My brain feels very, my brain very quickly feels scattered almost immediately. Yeah, this is very common. Is underneath the the system right because obviously your body's there you've got your body suit it's all con it is contained so that's one thing that's really good right it's there it's holding everything together the way it's supposed to but this this member i was talking if you were on at the beginning i talked about these waves and tsunamis and big waves that is the nervous system being aroused, being hyper aroused. So one of the first stages of neuroplastic healing, if I go back to neuroplastic healing, which is essentially what the work is that I do, it's helping the system first neuromodulate, come out of this threat, fight, flee response, the scatteredness, things feeling like they're kind of not contained in one space. Um, I'd be curious to know if anybody felt hard, if it felt hard to connect, maybe let me know, or if something else, just give me a little note. But yeah, Mary, this is a very common thing to actually drop down into the present moment without a task, without a mental task. And it can be very, very tricky when we've never been asked to do this and also very humbling and for some people really sad when they've been on this journey of healing and I inquire to just feel how your bum or your feet feel on the floor, not to change a damn thing, but just to notice that pressure. That's the first entry point into the nervous system. It's called the sensory um, peripheral nerve, it's part of the peripheral nervous system, right? If you had um, num numbing, freezing in your, you know, like when you go to a dentist and you get um, Novocaine and you don't feel your, your mouth and you kind of droop, right? You don't feel anything. Well, when we have a healthy nervous system that doesn't have Novocaine all over it, but we don't feel, that's in many ways a dissociation, it's a disconnection from our body. And sadly, so many people are walking around, even high level people who teach really high level stuff in the healing world, and yet this connection is not present all the time. And we need to cultivate it because if we don't have that presence, that capacity, that's the word, capacity and self-awareness to be in the present moment at that, I call it biological embodiment level. 
I'll say that again, biological embodiment, it's really hard for us to follow the impulses that are in our system and start to work with our stress chemistry. So to finish up on that, Mary, the cool thing is that this can change. It can be reshifted and rewired. It just takes some time. It takes building this capacity, practicing this over and over and over and over again, um, which can be very tough for some because they want an immediate result in like three weeks or a month. But when we've had a lot of years, and I will admit those that are a little older, and by older I mean like 55, 60, 70 plus, when we've had more years to groove our patterns, our wiring, it's it takes a little more time to rewire them. So, Helen says, it's been one of the most helpful exercises I've done. I didn't experience any connection with my environment before. I felt totally isolated and cut, and cut off. Cool. That's great. And this is the thing is it's like I keep looking outside right now. I've got a window there. There are so many of us that are on autopilot in our day. And we never, in the cliche term, stop and smell the roses, is actually very, very poignant for this. The reason why a lot of us have these constant states of adrenaline and we end up with chronic illness, even if you don't have past trauma, just the, the aspect of the go, 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 24-7, do everything, especially women, Whenever, you know, when women wanted to, to become workers and, and I'm not, I obviously I'm a woman that works, but when each parent, if I talk from the heterosexual parental situation, right? Mom, dad, child, when mom started doing everything as well as raising children and working, when did she have any time to take care of herself? There was no time to pause. This is why I think we actually see more women seeking out healing and who have chronic illness is there's just, they're having to do more and more. And when you ask a person to even pause for 15 seconds regularly throughout the day to just take stock of where they are, it gives their stress chemistry a chance to actually come down. It takes about eight minutes for adrenaline and cortisol to be sucked back up into the cells and integrated and, and peed out through our pee through the kidneys, filtered. When we stop, we have to stop and wait and then the system can recalibrate. Granted, when we stop, we really do stop and we're not constantly ruminating about what we have to do. Um, so we need to pause as much as we can and not just pause to take a deep breath, but look, see, feel, be in the moment, have self-awareness. Kim says, it felt really good. I stretched my feet into the down comforter, comforter on my bed and it feels good. I looked at my dog laying on the floor sleeping and one of his ears is stretched out on the rug and it looks cute. I bet it does look cute. This exercise makes me feel like I'm here and I'm present and it's nice. This used to be difficult for me to become present. Being present was terrifying. Totally. I want to respect that comment because when we've had traumatic events, again, doesn't have to be big, horrific stuff. It can be little, it could be a dental surgery when we were like three that scared the shit out of us. Eye surgeries are a very common thing that happens to really small um, children and infants when their eyes need to be corrected terrifying right think about that being present to that is terrifying therefore what does that smart little system do it shuts down and then it stops noticing what's around them this is why then those children often can go on being very clumsy very disoriented get into a lot of accidents because their system their kinesthetic sensory nervous system got shut down Rebecca asks, to heal from trauma, do you need to go through every trauma that has happened? No, you do not. Do you have to try to remember as many details as you can? No, you do not. Or can you heal your nervous system by these general exercises? No, you can't. <laughs> so here's a, yes, you can, and you can't. It depends on the severity, Rebecca. It depends on 
um, how high a person's ACE score is. If you guys look up ACE score, take my take the ACE score. ACE stands for Adverse Childhood Experiences. Um, the trouble with the ACE score, it doesn't take into account um, medical trauma, birth trauma, transgenerational trauma. Um, it doesn't take into account surgeries and near-death experiences as children. It covers more things like severe neglect, emotional, physical, sexual abuse, um, parents that were incarcerated, parents that were mentally ill, um, a, a, being in a family where there was a divorce. Even an, even an amicable divorce, believe it or not, will give a person an ACE score, a point. Um, so it depends on um, the level of trauma that a person starts with. I've seen in my programs, Rebecca, that people that have a, a good support system who aren't too old, you can heal at any age too. I want to really put that in there, but it depends on the other factors. But people who have a good support system who aren't too old, um, who have fairly good health habits, nutrition, exercise, have good have friends, um, and who are thirsty and curious to heal their stuff, they can actually do a lot of work by just working with the work, the level of exercises that I do. What I just taught you guys right now ain't the whole kit and caboodle. Um, in my longer program, there's like 52 neurosensory exercises that start at that orientation level, and we cover everything from reconnecting with the joints of the body, the levels of the diaphragms, the kidneys, the adrenals, the brainstem, the gut, movement. We do a lot of mindful movement and we learn a lot of the deep theory around trauma physiology, attachment, all, all of it. So it depends on the person. But the thing about healing every trauma Remember, if you were on a second ago, I gave that example of like the swimming pool representing how much capacity is in the body. And in that swimming pool, the beach balls are the stressors. If we can take out a big ass ball, what happens is it leaves more room in that swimming pool. And with time, sometimes those other stressors, they just kind of pop out on their own. Sometimes if you increase the capacity of your system to feel, to sense sensation, to be with emotion, if you really, really work on that, again, there's, there isn't like this scientific principle, but I've seen this happen. People will, will slowly kind of like the balls will just kind of like ooze out of the pool on their own. The other, if you guys, if the computer keeps cutting out, log back in, come out and come back in. Because it might not be, my Wi-Fi connection has been pretty strong now, so it might be the yours needs to come, you need to go out and come back in. Um, so you do not need to heal and do and work on every single one. Um, and if, again, it was pre-verbal, you aren't gonna remember the details because your cognitive brain for remembering detail wasn't online yet. So that's where, again, the work that I've put together and my training is working at the body level, working at the level of where the stress chemistry gets hit, like working directly with the adrenaline response, the adrenals, the kidneys, how the brain signals down. And one of the things I mentioned a second ago, or not a second ago, it was quite a while ago, was that many people think about neuroplasticity as a brain thing. I flip it on its head and really, and this is just, isn't just me, this is all of my teachers, the brain to us in the somatic world, working at the level of the stress physiology, the fight, flight, freeze, that isn't just in your brain. That is coursing through your veins as chemicals, as hormones. And those chemicals, some of them come out of the brain, but they actually come out of your adrenal glands, adrenaline and cortisol. Cortisol, when over time, um, and Erin, if you're still here, maybe you can link up the, uh, t um, the adrenaline fatigue article. It was a long one from last December. 
the the two unknown pieces of adrenal fatigue. I can't remember exactly what it was, but by working at that level, it actually then influences the brain. Whereas the brain to us is still an end organ. It's still an organ that gets affected by stress. Stress isn't actually happening in the brain, it's happening in the physiology, and then it affects the brain, it affects the digestion, it affects the immune system, it affects our capacity to think. I'm just making sure I saw another comment. So, Rebecca, to finish up on that, it's, um, you don't have to, you don't have to remember, and um, general exercises aren't usually enough from what I've seen. Um, and the exercises that I've created are not your run-of-the-mill um, breathing, meditation, mindfulness exercises. I actually steer people away from generic stuff. Um, if they need a tonic, a management strategy to keep their system in check because they have to go to work and they have to take care of their kids, then by all means use something that will help you manage. Just like sometimes you need to take an Advil or an aspirin when you have a headache, um, but if that headache or that you know keeps coming back, you're going to want to know what is causing that from being there all the time. Um, John asks, I was hit by a car in front of most of my friends at the age of 19, and a father who has anxiety, mother's side has addiction, I also have battled addiction, plus my front, frontal lobe was fractured. When you say lobe, do you mean your skull, or I'm assuming you mean your skull? I am numb, as you say, can't function because of benzos and antidepressants the doctor has prescribed. Fear has overtaken me. I really have a hard time thinking. Capacity is limited, plus no restful sleep. Whoa. So yeah, John, this is a that's a big history, and um, I'm really sorry that all these things have happened. And of course, I don't know your age. But know that your system can heal. Know that it won't be a walk in the park. I'm going to be really honest. When benzodiazepines and antidepressants have been in the mix, it does make things a little tricky. I'm not sure if you're still on them. Um, but I do believe that the, the basics that I teach, the information and the exercises can help to build capacity. So like you said, capacity is limited and restful sleep is not there. And that makes sense because as your nervous system is in this shutdown, even though it's shut down, you, there's, a, there's a level of shutdown where that shutdown actually isn't restful. It isn't restorative. The system can't heal and regenerate when we're so shut down. So. I would love to recommend, John, if you haven't downloaded some of my freebies, get on that and read and take advantage of some of my free lessons. If you can join some of my programs, I would highly recommend that too. But also, if you can, seeking out a somatic experiencing therapist, I have a referral list that I, I send out to people if they request it via my site, people that work by Skype um, throughout few in Europe, mostly North America, Canada, and Australia, I think it's important to actually do some work to build that capacity because you be might be surprised when your capacity grows a little bit, it allows other parts of the system to finally start to have a bit of a breather and heal. I think this is you, 45. Okay, and you say um, one half of a mil of benzo. So I'm not a psychiatrist, so you know I'm not an MD. But um, the thing with the benzos, if it's um, something like Ativan or Clonazepam, eventually I always suggest to people if you can start titrating off of that stuff, do so, but not until you have built a bit more capacity in the nervous system. Um, I'm, I'm not going to lie, they are tough drugs to get off of from what I've seen, but it can happen. I've seen it happen, and it means being staying with it and having faith that you can get through this and build capacity. 45 is still pretty young, believe it or not. So know that um, there's, there's, there's light at that end, but you just got to work on it piece by piece by piece. 
and working on some of the traumas that might be still quite prominent in your history that are more apparent, more vivid, so that you can start to take those, literally those beach balls that I talked about out of the swimming pool so that the capacity can grow. So that was what I'd like to mention. Thanks, Erin. I saw that you put the adrenal fatigue article up there. So what I've been talking about, I'm talking about a lot of stuff. I'm talking about the nervous system. I'm talking about neuroplastic healing, the importance of ordering and sequencing the healing. Um, if we don't understand the sequencing, we can waste a lot of time and money doing things that are not helping. So let's just assume that everybody here eats pretty well. You get a lot of good fat in your diet, protein. You've got healthy support. If you've got some form of chronic illness or mental illness, I cannot recommend it enough. Get educated. Take advantage of all the stuff on my YouTube channel, on my site, my blog. Download my free resources. Um, get educated so you understand where you fall on the spectrum because there is nothing wrong with a lot of the healing modalities out there. But I, I've been using this example for, for quite a, the last week and a bit. If you went to a doctor and you had a very bad bacterial infection, bad, right? And you went and he's like, okay, just do this. You know, here's a good diet to ch follow. You should do some mindfulness. Oh, and here's an antiviral. This works for other things. So maybe it'll work for you. That would be illegal, probably not good. Standard of care would be shit. Um, you want to make sure that if you have a bacterial infection, you get an antibiotic. Yes, you want to make sure your diet is good and maybe you need some psychological help to deal with that infection, but bottom line, you need an antibiotic. And what's occurred in our mind-body alternative healing world is there's no structure, nobody has really taught people what to look at first. History, taking history, asking about adverse childhood experiences, asking about your capacity to be with sensation. When I work with my students, it takes us, if you watch the anger vlog that Aaron posted further up on this thread, it's the YouTube video, we wait for seven weeks before we start dealing with working with anger and healthy aggression and the movements of the jaw and making sound because I want to make sure that people have the foundations, they have the capacity and awareness to stay with the uncomfortable, and they have the wherewithal to know when something doesn't feel right, they stop. It isn't about I'm in this class and I'm gonna um, um, power through because I paid my money and everyone's gonna think less of me if I leave. No. The human nervous system is delicate and fragile when it has had trauma. But, or and, when it is resilient and it has capacity to feel and be with emotion, it is so resilient and it's strong. And we need to remember that. So. Um, it's very important that we understand the sequential nature of neuroplastic healing. And right now, these words, trauma and rewire the brain and nervous system, are just being thrown around by a lot of folks who don't understand these sequencings. does not mean that these people are not lovely people who want to help and heal people. But if they don't understand what neuroplastic sequencing is, what neuromodulation is, what neurodifferentiation is, and when those are supposed to be deployed in a healing regimen, then you might want to look somewhere else. Um, the tough part is that not many people are understanding this yet. Um, so just by you guys being here and listening to this, you are a step above most people in that community, sadly. So education, awareness, building capacity, check out my stuff, learn, question, ask questions. Um, and I mentioned a second ago, to me the brain is an end organ. The stress chemistry, 
your neurophysiology, it runs the show. You can have all the best thoughts in the world in your head, all the great best lists and ways of doing things set out and be super organized, but if under that you've got the stress physiology that is still in fear, that's still scared, that's still looping, that's going through your blood. It's not just in your brain, it's affecting your brain. And so by building more capacity, by growing the system, expanding it, taking out the stresses that don't need to be there, the system then starts to heal. <laughs> yes, thank you, Kim. Education, awareness, building capacity. The next after that, if we had a number four, and I don't wanna get into all of it, I keep saying stress chemistry, stress physiology, like it's going out of style. It's regulation, regulation of the stress physiology. And again, when we've had dysregulation from an early age, due to surgeries, trauma, accidents, adversity, emotional abuse, insecure attachment, misattunement from our parents, that stress chemistry, it doesn't know how to, how to be smooth and how to go with the punches and the flows up and down, up and down. It will spike or it will drop or it'll do a bit of both. And we don't want that. <laughs> Thanks, Kim. Um, and Heidi, yeah, 41, I'm 41, so um, no, you're not too old. Any, like I said, people, any age can do this. It's not a matter of age, it's a matter of how deeply grooved those patterns have been. And it has just been my experience that when we're a little older, it takes a little more time, a little more patience, a little more support, and it can be very frustrating because I commend the older people that are in my work who are in their 60s, fives plus, because it's sad. There's a grief going on because they didn't know this in their 30s. No one was talking about this. The doctors didn't know. Um, and it's really tough. It's really tough. It's like when a, a parent has raised a child and then they realize that tummy time was not good and letting a baby cry in the crib at night wasn't good and formula wasn't the best and all these things. And then a parent goes, ah, you know, I've just totally messed up my kid. It's doomed. Um, but it's not because we can repair these things. But when you first learn it, it can be a little bit of a shock. But for many, it can be liberating and it can be freeing to know this is why I have gone to 20 plus healers and I am still flat on my back and fatigued. Nobody has ever talked about the stress chemistry. So I hope this has been useful. If you have other questions, write them into the comment block. Um, that's it. Like you know, you can find me in this group, my site, irenelion.com, my YouTube channel is getting a lot of action. I have a new video up there that I put up last night on working with anger. If you watch that video, which is a pretty personal video. I put something out really different. I was only gonna share it with my students and they're like, no, nah, just put a little context and put some articles and be fine. If you watch that video and read the articles and watch the other video that's in there, don't do it all in one sitting. Don't do it all in one sitting. Take a few days. It would be like a mini workshop on how to work with anger and healthy aggression. So I recommend that. Um, and that's it. Have a lovely transition into 2017. And uh, I'll be doing these more regularly. I'll have two in January, two in Feb, and I'll try to pop in a little bit more frequently as we head into 2017. Thank you for being here, everybody, and we will see you later.